And so you have me, and of course we're going to continue on in the book of Samuel, and those of you are going, oh no, not more history and geography. I want to remind you of George Santayana. It's not a household name today, but George Santayana was an influential man around the turn of the 20th century. Born in 1863 in Spain, came to America, became an American citizen, went to Harvard. After he graduated from Harvard, he, a couple years, he went back to teach at Harvard, taught at Harvard for something like 20-some years. And uh, he was a, a brilliant philosopher and poet and fool. I say that with all due respect because the Bible itself says that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And George was a prominent atheist. Let's see if I can get this back in place. It's Becky's fault. Anyway, the one thing that uh, George said that I can fully agree with is that those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Very true words. Winston Churchill said something very serious. George influenced a lot of people. If I gave you the list of the names of the people that he influenced, you would recognize a lot of those names, and you would recognize the part that they have contributed to the cultural rot that we are experiencing today. It's been a long gradual process over the last hundred years. And in Isaiah, the uh, fifth chapter, the 20th verse, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, is the, uh, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Today, it is a uh, pleasure to cover this part of Scripture. You know, we've been, uh, we started out this study in the book of Judges, and we've gone through each one of the Judges, and the reason we're in Samuel is because Samuel is the last of the Judges. And he is, and so we're going to be going through his books, and then we will be done with Judges. And so much of going through Judges has been an exercise in, in depression. You know, the, you, you think, don't these people learn anything? They keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And, of course, then I have to sit myself down in a quiet spot and say, don't you ever learn anything? You keep doing the same stuff over and over again, you know. With that. But today, it's a good story. And so we start in the 14th chapter, and if you will remember when we covered the 13th chapter, that we left the two armies juxtaposed against one another. The army of the Philistines is out there in Lone Pine, remember? McMash? And they have gathered there, and they've got 10 times more soldiers than do the Israelites, who are uh, just a little bit uh, the other side of O'Neill Junction, a little bit north of O'Neill Junction. They're not that far apart, these groups. And as was the habit of armies, then, you know, you get your army moved in. It takes a lot of work. You've got to haul stuff in. You've got to bring supplies in. You've got to be able to feed them. You've got to set up almost villages in order to maintain your army. And they sit there and they spend a lot of time. They'll spend months getting all set up. They're just within... You know, back then they didn't have howitzers and, and guns and stuff that they could shoot back and forth. So they'd get all lined up, you know, and you have your rules of war and how they're going to do it. And then finally the day comes and they blow the, the trumpets and they go in there and hack each other up with uh, swords. 
and, uh, and tell, see who wins. And so here they are. They're all set up. And this area is uh, north of Jerusalem. We're just a few miles north of Jerusalem. If you think in terms of uh, Redmond as being Jerusalem, and then uh, Lone Pine is where McMash is, and, and uh, uh, O'Neill Junction is about where uh, uh, Gibeah is. And Gibeah is where uh, Saul built his palace. It's up on a right raised area. You could see all of his kingdom there. And he built a palace there. And, you know, history repeats itself. The king of Jordan decided that he would build a palace there, right on top of Saul's palace, the rubble of Saul's palace. And he did it. He got it all up, and partly done. And then this little thing called the War of 1967 broke out, and Jordan was pushed back out of that area, and it became a part of Israel where it rightfully belonged. And so today, there sits this empty hulk of a building that he started to build for himself. The best laid plans of mice and men gang after. Okay, we're talking about this uh, big open area that's north of Jerusalem. And actually, if you're coming from the west or you're coming from the east to come into Jerusalem, you have to come down through this area of Benjamin because of the way the countryside is laid out. It's full of all these ravines and canyons. They call them wadis there. And uh, it's very rough territory coming from either direction. And in fact, there is a, a very steep route that comes up from Jericho into Jerusalem. But the easier route is a little bit further to the north and then you come down through uh, this area of Benjamin into Ramah and into uh, Gibeah and then work your way down into Jerusalem. So this is a very strategic area and there were a lot of fights that took place in that area. And, uh, and so here they're, they're lined up and they're ready to do their thing. It says, now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Now there's a reason for this. Uh, Jonathan's approach to life and his approach to his relationship to God is much different than Saul's. Saul is an insecure man. He has, uh, he kind of feels inferior and he compensates for that. Sound like any leaders that we know today. Uh, and he is hesitant to do what has to be done. And so Saul finds himself in this area. He started out with 3,000 men. He's only got 600 now because most of the people, you know how it is that uh, rats leave a sinking ship. And so his army has kind of dissipated. A lot of the people who have been subjugated by the Philistines over all these years, they just kind of joined in. They, they decide, well, I'm just going to stay with the Philistines. And so there's a lot of people there. And then other people have just crawled off and sneaked off and they've gone into the hidey holes and places just to get away from it because they can see there's a big slaughter coming. And so Saul is hesitant and he is waiting and he's undecided and he doesn't really know all that's going on. Jonathan is a man who has placed his trust in God and he is not as self-interested as Saul is. You think about it as the story progresses and we see how Jonathan and David become friends. Jonathan is, is very much aware in the last chapter, remember, the, because uh, Saul took things into his own hands. He decided, I'm going to offer the sacrifice. We don't have to wait for uh, Samuel to show up. We don't have to wait for the priest to do this. I'll do it myself. He's one of those God helps those who help themselves kind of guys. And so it was because of what he did and because he did not respect the way that God had laid everything out, then his kingdom was taken away. Samuel shows up and he says, because you've done this, your kingdom is not going to endure. It's going to disappear. Jonathan has to be aware of that. 
So here you are, the prince. You're the, the prince of Wales. And, uh, and you find out all of a sudden that you're not going to get to be king. It would be easy to be uh, jealous and to cling to that and to try to fight that and to try to maintain power and to try to keep it to himself. But Jonathan wasn't that way at all. Instead, he became very close friends with David, who he knew was going to replace him. He had no thought of that. And so it is as, the, as they approach the battle, Jonathan has a different outlook upon what it takes to win the battle. This, is, this bit of scripture right here is extremely important for each one of us to understand and to take very personally. Because just as it applied 3,000 years ago, it applies today. And so Jonathan has taken his armor bearer and he hasn't told the general. Because that's how the way armies work. You don't do stuff unless the word comes down from the top. You don't just take it into your own hands. And I think Jonathan is made of the stuff of SEAL Team 6. And so he takes his armor bearer and says, come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. This word garrison, remember I talk, told you the, the, the English word garrison has several different meanings that, depending on how it's used in the sentence. The garrison can be the men themselves. The garrison can be the place where they are housed. And so it is even in the Hebrew that there are three different words that we uh, translate as garrison. Uh, back in the uh, 13th chapter, the third verse, we talked about how uh, Jonathan went in and he attacked the garrison. And that word there is uh, netzib. And netzib means a pillar a monument, a military monument. So he did not necessarily go in there and whack up any soldiers, but he defaced something. He went into their territory, and he, uh, he made an, an inroad there. And so then in uh, this uh, usage right here in verse 1, uh, the word is uh, matzah, uh, matzab, and it means a place. So it would be more like the housing of the garrison. So what we have here in the place where Jonathan goes is that there's a small outpost, uh, not the whole army. And the whole army is over here, and there's a main uh, a pass where you can easily get through. And Jonathan has gone over here to a, uh, a spot. Uh, it's a, a wadi it's, uh, that goes through there. And it's called the Wadi, today it's called the Wadi Suinit. And it's a, this deep crevice that goes through and down. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But he's over away from where the actual pass is. And there's this outpost, this little garrison, where there's some, some uh, uh, of the uh, Philistine soldiers there. So let's go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side, he told, uh, but he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah. So he's kind of out of town a little ways, and he's, it says he's under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. Migron means uh, the precipice. So he's kind of in a place hiding under a rock near the pomegranate tree. And we've seen this before. There's all these things that happen, and they take place, and then they take place again. Because if you'll think back to when we covered Judges, the 20th chapter, and remember when the Benjamites had done something really heinous, and they decided they are going to wipe out all of Benjamin. And when it got right down to it, on uh, Judges, the 20th uh, chapter, uh, the 45th through the 47th verses, it says... And they turned and they fled toward the wilderness into the rock of Ramon. And they gleaned of them in the highways 5,000 men and pursued hard after them unto Gidom. And they slew 2,000 men of them, so that all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword, and all were men of valor. But 600 
men turned and fled to the wilderness unto the rock Ramon and bowed in the rock Ramon four months. Ha, Ramon means pomegranate. It could be that Saul is in the very same place with his 600 men that the 600 Benjamites had held out just a uh, hundred years before. And so we find these, these uh, things happening over and over again. And so he's there in Megron, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. And then he does a genealogy of the priesthood, and it says, Ahia, the son of Ahitub, Ahia, who also becomes Abimelech, Ahimelech, and uh, he's the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother. You remember Ichabod is the last son of Phinehas. Remember that he was born the day that Phinehas was killed in battle. And that was the day that his grandfather Eli died also. He was an old man, 98 years old. And when he heard the word that his, both his sons had been killed, and uh, that but the thing that really put him over the edge was the fact that the Ark of the Covenant, they had taken it out into the battle, thinking that it was some kind of a good luck charm for him. And they took it into the battle, and the Philistines took it. And when uh, Eli heard that, he fell over backwards, and he said he was a big, fat guy, and it broke his neck. And he died right on the spot. And Ichabod was born that day, and his mother, who died in childbirth, named him Ichabod, the glory has departed, the glory has departed. And so now we find some generations go by here, and Ahia, who's the son of Ahitub, which is Ichabod's older brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, and the Lord's priest in Shiloh. And he is wearing an ephod. And uh, the a fold was the uh, vestiture that they wore, and it had the jewels all over it, and it had a, a pouch in it in which was kept the urim and the thummim, which are some kind of rocks that they would throw and use to, it's kind of like flinging the dice, and that's how they would make decisions and try to discern God's will for them. So Saul is there, he's got the priest there, he's got all the trappings there, and he's waiting and he didn't know, it says, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And so, it says, between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the one on the one side, on the north side, was called Bothes. And the name of the other was Seneh. And uh, so he goes over. So like I'm telling you, he's a little bit east of where the passage is. And here's this deep ravine. And you go there today and you can see it. And it's a fairly deep. I, in looking at the pictures, I, I did a, a kind of a fly through. And I can't tell exactly how deep it is. I've got a feeling it's something like Smith Rock area. Where you, you know how you have to walk way down steep like that and then walk way up steep on the other side. It was that kind of a situation. And uh, in this crevice, on the one side, uh, the, the north wall is very light. It's tan and white, and it shines in the sunshine. The south wall stays dark all the time, and it's, it's uh, dark and a kind of a blackish rock. And uh, uh, it's just a marked contrast between the two. The name Baltets means shining. And the name Seneh means thorny, thorns. And so he's at these two big rocks, and above the other, the rock Botets, behind that is a flat spot. And as the scripture says, and as you look at the picture, it's about a half an acre of flat area up there. And all the area leading down to it, the rolling hills on either side, the, the ground is covered with stones. They're all big rocks everywhere. They're just all over the place, these white rocks that just uh, pepper the land. It's very rugged territory to be in. And so they sneak up to this area, and they're on the south side, and the Philistines are on the north side. It says the forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, 
Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. And here is the key to the whole scripture. This is the one that you need to memorize. This is really something that applies, has applied over the ages, applies now, and will apply into the future. He says, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. How many times we get into these problems in our life? The army is arrayed against us. It's just over us within striking distance of us. And we see that we are outnumbered 10 to 1. And then we have the choice. We can be like Saul and try to draw on our own strength and our own machinations. Or we can be like Jonathan who says, I'm going to rely upon the Lord God. Because with God, it's nothing is impossible. With God, he can provide, whether by few or by many. How many times have we been overwhelmed and we can't see what's going to happen? Elisha was that way. Uh, found himself in that kind of a situation because he was uh, revealing the secrets of the enemy and they said, he knows what you're saying in your bedroom. He doesn't, he, we don't know. And they said, well, let's go and get him. So they go down to the town where Elisha was and they surround the town. And his servant gets up early in the morning and it says, and when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and I'm, uh, I'm over in 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 6, a couple of verses here, uh, verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God had, was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? We are outnumbered. We are surrounded. They are everywhere. We have no chance. How are we going to get out of this? And often that's our reaction to the problems that face us in life. When maybe it would be better that we took the attitude of Elisha, who was quite calm. And it says, he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I go, what? The servant is talking to it's just the two of them there. It says, and then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. I pray that our eyes could be opened that we might see that God is ready to show himself strong on our behalf. It says, and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, the chariots of fire didn't have to come down off the mountain at all. Elisha then says, Lord, we just smite these people blind. And so all these guys were blind. Elisha goes out and he takes them. He takes a few prisoners and he leads them to the king. And so God is able to show himself strong on our part. And Jonathan is not the only one who is able to come to this same conclusion. Later on, one of the later kings, uh, Asa, uh, in Second Chronicles, the 14th chapter, I'm gonna, I want to lead up to the 11th verse. And so I'm going to read just a little bit here uh, going up to the 11th verse. Asa is the king. He's just come into, into power. And Asa is a man whose heart is right and he's doing good. Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. And he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places, and he broke down the images, and he cut down the groves, and he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. 
Also, he took away out of the cities of Judah the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land was a head rest, and he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities and make them walls and towers and gates and bars while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him, and he hath given us rest on every side. It's interesting how that happens. And Asa had an army of men and bare targets and spears out of Judah, 300,000, and out of Benjamin that bare shields and drew bows, 204 score thousand. All were mighty men of valor. And then it happened. There came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with a host, and he's got a thousand thousand. He's got a million men and 300, uh, 300 uh, chariots and came uh, unto Mershah. And when Asa went out against him and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephatha at Mershah. And this is, then we pick it up in the 11th verse, the key verse here. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and he said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on thee. In thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. And that day the million-man army was set to rout, and they were driven out. God just wiped them away. It says, and the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them to Gerar, and it says, went on. And then it said that he had peace. In fact, he had peace for 35 years. Nobody came against him. And then in the 36th year, He, uh, he had the Syrians come against him. Baasha, the Syrian, came down from the north into, of all places, this area between Gibeah and Michmash and Ramah, where Samuel is from, and Giba is over here. And so he comes into this area, comes down into Ramah, and he starts to build a fortified area because anybody who controls that area controls everybody that comes into Jerusalem. And so here's Asa faced with this problem. And so what does Asa do? Instead of remembering back in his youth and going to the Lord God and acknowledging that God has the power to do what needs to be done. Instead, he goes into his bag of tricks. And he has a treaty with... And so he says to this guy, you go over there and go against this Baasha. And he did. And Baasha said, okay, I'm going to quit. And he left what he did, and he went back up to Syria. And then uh, when he went back to Syria, then uh, Asa came in and tore down all the stuff that Baasha had built, and he used it to build up his cities. He did that. Well, the end result is then found in Second Chronicles, the 16th chapter, and it says the 7th verse. It says, and at that time, Hanani, the seer, from, uh, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord, and this is a good one for us to memorize also, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. 
Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. Asa didn't live very much longer, but he had war and trouble for the remainder of that time. So there's nothing for the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. And I think that is so wonderful. This armor bearer is an unnamed man. And you know, there are unnamed servants who did wonderful things for their master, and they're recorded in the, in the scripture. And I think it's good for us to note because not everybody becomes a king. Not everybody becomes a general. Not everybody becomes somebody that they name streets after. But everybody is important in the kingdom of God. And everybody is useful in the kingdom of God. And this man was faithful and he was loyal. And he was courageous. Never got his name recorded. 3,000 years later, we don't know who he is. We know who Jonathan was, but we don't know who the armor bearer was. And he was just as courageous and valorous as Joshua. But God chooses whom he will elevate, and he chooses whom he will put down. But he honors everyone who does the job. And then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. In order to make something happen, you have to make a stand. It has to be a public stand, and people have to know where you are. And that's the way they decided they were going to do it. So they make this plan. He publicly declares, and then he sets up a test. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. And if they say thus unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say thus, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. You know, there is nothing wrong when you're in the battlefield for the Lord Jesus Christ that you ask for the knowledge of what you should do, where you should go and where you should turn. And as you see things unfold, you'll see him work on your behalf. I'm glad that I learned this early on in life as a young man. Uh, I've told the story before about how uh, I got drafted, and so I joined the Navy and, and all, and I was down at three months, down in boot camp in San Diego. And after boot camp, I got an A school. It was going to be another three months. And so I asked the chiefs, the guys that had been in the Navy for a while, and, and what I should do. Should I move Gwen down from Seattle to San Diego? And they said, no, 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 don't do that, because when you get out of that A school, they're going to send you who knows where, and the Navy isn't going to pay for these moves. And so you've got to just have her stay there for another three months, and, uh, and then when you get your orders, you'll know what to do. Well, that didn't seem good enough to us, and Gwen and I on the phone, we prayed about it. We wanted to know. So he asked, Lord, would you make it known to us on, by April 1st? We needed to know by April 1st so that she could give notice to her, uh, to her employer, so we could give notice to our landlord, and so we could make the move if that was God's will that we should move. And so it was that we submitted resumes to all the hospitals down there because she worked in a hospital at the time. And she got back letters of saying, you know, thanks for sending your resume. We've got it on file. You know, come see us when you get here. You know, blah, blah, blah. None of them were committed, committal at all. And then one morning she woke up. Uh, uh, the phone woke her up because she worked a night, a night shift. She was sleeping late. And the phone woke her up. And on the other end was, I, I can't even remember the name of the guy. Uh, uh, but he said, uh, Mrs. Elster, did you get my letter? 
She's in Bay General Hospital. No, I didn't get a letter from Bay General Hospital. He says, well, when the letter comes, I want you to disregard it. He says, I have a job here, and I would like to offer it to you. And he says, I've never done this before without a personal interview, but I want to offer you the job. She said, when's it ready? She said, it's ready right now. She said, I can't be there for at least three weeks. I have to give two weeks notice. We've got to pack. We have to move. And he says, that's fine. I'll hold the job for you. And, you know, we took that as a yes because it just so happened that that was the morning of April 1st. And so we moved. We went down there. And when she went in for the interview, they're going to start her at the low bottom pay. And she was thinking, well, there's these other places I can go and look. And then she thought, no, this is the job that the Lord gave me. Well, two months later, they made her the head of the department. And as it turned out, I was in San Diego my entire enlistment. Spent all four years there. So you can know early on. You thought, you know what? God will let us know. He'll answer that. And I've got other stories, you know, stories I can tell you with Ken and Vicki and the buying of our house and stuff like that. Things that happened in the establishing of the church and places that we went and how we moved. And then when we moved back up here, even the ways that God led us to do this, that, and the other. I think even uh, uh, I have been involved in ministry my entire life, but not in formal ministry. And I can only think, uh, well, I, I, I can't say that. I, I was formerly a minister. My, I started out 50 years ago. I was a youth pastor at the Tillamook Christian Church for about three years. And uh, after that, though, we went to Seattle, and then I got drafted, and we went down there, and we worked in churches down there. We started a church down there. We got involved with Calvary Chapel down there. And uh, we ended up coming back to Central Oregon, and then economics took us to Seattle, and we were, we were in Seattle. Uh, we were called to work uh, in, uh, with the children's ministry at the church that we attended there and did that for about five years. And, uh, and then that was the one time that I actually applied for a job at the church. They needed a family pastor, and I thought that I could do that job. And I uh, applied for it, and I don't know, it just evaporated. I, they didn't want me to do that job, that was for sure. And I never really thought too much about it as to why, but shortly thereafter, it, the opportunity came. We needed to move back to Central Oregon to be able to take care of my mother. And the scary part is, is that she was my age now when we decided we needed to take care of her. <laughs> so anyway, we were able to do that. We had no entanglements. We were able to move down here and then the Lord has led us in various places, and we've been here at this church for the last 20 years doing whatever we need to do. And I see how in all of these things, God kind of leads us, and he takes care of things, and he, and he fights the battle, and he brings the end. And a lot of times we get ups, you know, kind of upset and, and worried about the situation, but we don't need to. He takes care of it. And it will all fall into place. And we kind of see that as this uh, story unfolds. So the both of them discovered themselves. They went out there and they did it. And that's another thing. It's one thing to plan. It's one thing to talk about it. But it's a whole other thing to go out there and do it. To make yourself vulnerable. To make yourself useful. And to make yourself willing. So they did this. They went out and they discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid themselves. They know that they're only up against 600 men now because they all disappeared. It says, And, uh, it says, uh, and the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. He says, that's it. That's the word. We've won the battle. It's over. Come with me. Let's just go take it. And it says that Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet because it's 
that is a steep cliff going down there. And uh, the, uh, and the climb up the other side, on the Bozette side, is, uh, is just as steep, that it, it's a deal. I don't think it's as bad as climbing Smith Rock, but it was still pretty stiff, steep. He says, and the first slaughter with Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within as it were a half an acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. So they went in there and as Jonathan would knock him down, the armor bearer would finish him off. And it says, and they went through there and killed him. And then the panic started. It says, uh, and there was trembling in the host in the field and among all the people and the garrison and the spoilers. They also trembled. And then on top of that, there was an earthquake. Our friends Mary and Brian went through the earthquake a couple years ago up in Alaska. Mary said she ran to the front door and to get under the protection of being in a door. They have a, a big island in the kitchen. I say it's about an eight foot by eight foot granite slab that's on that island. And that granite slab moved 18 inches. Every cupboard came out, every dish fell out and broke. The refrigerator came out. Everything came out of the refrigerator and broke and all that. All the cupboards in the house came out. Everything went on the floor. Mary said it took her several hours because she was barefoot to make it back to the kitchen because there was so much broken glass everywhere. She had to be really, really careful and trying to clean things up and do that. They spent uh, weeks uh, cleaning it up. And then we went up for two weeks and we helped clean up. We were still cleaning up and fixing and doing all of that. And while we were there, I got to experience an earthquake. And you can hear it. You can hear the rumbling and then you feel the shake. And it was just the aftershocks. We didn't have any big quakes. But it was kind of interesting experience. Glad I didn't have to go through the big one, but it was fun to go through the little ones. But so here they are, these guys, they come up and they join in the battle. And as soon as they join in the battle, miraculously, the earth starts to shake. And the spoilers, the guys that go out there and kind of start the, the fighting, they were trembling. All the people that were there were trembling. The, the Philistines all get uh, uh, spooked and uh, they start to run. They start to run. It says, in the watchman of Saul, they're in Gibeah of Benjamin. They look. They're up on a high spot, and they can see what's going on. And they see the multitude melting away. They see the people, are, they're fleeing. And they went on beating down one another. These people are fleeing, and they're panicking, and they're starting to hit themselves, and they're every man for himself. And you ever seen a, a panicking crowd? People get trampled by that. It says, and... Oh, I hit the wrong thing. Uh, they went beating down one another and, and then said Saul unto the people that were with him, number now and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said unto Ahiah, bring hither the ark of God. You would think they would have learned their lesson. They lost the ark to the Philistines once. And so I don't know if it's, if it's, in that close proximity, but at least they're going to try to figure out what God is doing. It says, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel, and it came to pass when Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, withdraw that hand. So apparently he's going for the Urim and Thummim. They're going to try and figure out what God wants them to do. And Saul says, oh, never mind. Never mind. I think I've got this. I remember seeing a movie. I don't know what it, I believe I can, don't know what the name of the movie was. I think it was Burt Reynolds who was in it. He's he's stranded at sea, and he's got no hope. And he's trying to swim for shore, and he's praying. And he prays, oh God, if you get me out of this, you know, I'm going to give you everything that I have and I'm going to become a monk and I'm going to do all these things. And then he gets a little bit closer to the land and then 
his promises kind of back off. And then he gets closer and the promise becomes weaker and weaker as to what he's going to do, you know, less and less. Until finally his feet touch the bottom and he walks and he says, never mind, God. You don't have to save me. And I get the feeling that that's the way it is with Saul. Never mind, I think we know what we're going to do. And so he doesn't want to check. It says, withdraw thine hand. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a great discomfiture. And moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines, all the Quislings, they came out of the woodwork, and they turned with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. And likewise, all the men of Israel, which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, so they also followed hard after them in battle. And they chased these people out of town, back into, the, into Philistia. So the Lord saved Israel that day. And that is the point. The Lord saved Israel that day. And the battle passed over even unto Beth Aven. God is able, he is willing to do what he did then and to do it now. In 1917, World War I, and the army of uh, Edmund Atherton was there. The British were in Jerusalem, and the Turks were holding out in that area up around Gibeah and McMash in that area. And they didn't know exactly how they were going to do it. But one of the things they did for the British when they came into the area is they passed out Bibles to them and said, you know, read in the Old Testament, get familiar with the geography and the, the culture and the things that are going on. You find that in these stories of the Old Testament. And one of the uh, uh, majors, oh, I can't think of his last name. His first name was Vivian. I don't think Vivian's here today, <laughs> is she? Anyway, he was reading this Bible, and he's reading in Samuel, 14th chapter, with his, and he says, this is where we are. We're here. And he goes to uh, General, and, uh, General Allenby, and he says, uh, read this. They read, Why don't we try that? And so they sent a small group of soldiers down through the ravine up onto the hill and surprised the Turks. And they defeated them. They chased them like that. And when they did, the main army of the Turkish army panicked and ran and took off. And they chased them down and they captured a, a whole bunch and they won the battle and they had full control of the entire area. It was under British control. Now, why do you suppose that God would want that to happen? that he would recreate exactly the same situation for the British. Might it be that 30 years later in 1949, it was the British who gave up that area to the Jews that they might have a homeland? Now, I'm reasonably certain that the Russians wouldn't have done that or anybody else that was involved in World War I. The Germans certainly wouldn't have. And so God brings about a victory in a battle for a specific end. And a lot of times we don't know what that end is. And a lot of times we don't know what the end is going to be of the little things that we do. I'm reminded of the song that uh, came out, I don't know, 35 years ago, something like that. It's called, uh, Thank You for Giving to the Lord. It says about somebody who came, they arrive in heaven... And someone comes up to them and says, thank you for giving to the Lord. Mine is a life that was changed. And it tells a story about how somebody was a Sunday school teacher and taught them this or that and the other. And now that person is in heaven because they did it. Or it was some other little thing. Some, they gave to a missionary, and that missionary went to an area and then had a big impact. And then this person, obscure, comes up and says, thank you. Because of what you did, I'm here. And a lot of times we have no knowledge whatsoever of what it is that we did that brings about that end. 
I hope that there's some of us here who are Jonathan. I hope there's nobody here that's Saul. I hope that a lot of us who are here are that unnamed armor bearer. See, there's a lesson to be taken. Now, this story goes on, the last half of this chapter. And if you want to find out how it comes out, then you'll have to show up on Wednesday because I'm going to teach Wednesday night and continue this. But just remember that God can save by many or by few. God can do it. Let him. Let him. Let's pray. Lord, how easy it is for us to forget your mighty power and ability to save and your willingness to do so. How often, Lord, we get tied up in the affairs of our busy days. How often, Lord, we become discouraged because of what we see happening in the culture around us and the, the political intrigue that goes on and, and, and all all the injustice that we see. And it's easy for us to lose sight of the fact that the battle is yours. And Lord, so today we want to acknowledge that you and you alone are all powerful, that you who sees the end before the beginning are able to bring it about. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would empower us to have that kind of faith. We recognize, Lord, that what you desire is that we believe you. And so bolster us that as we live our life this week, we would believe you and allow you to have your way. Lord, we want to be useful to your kingdom. Please show us the manner in which we should do that. We pray this in Jesus' name.